Um, thank you very much, Izzy, for those incredibly uh, kind words. Um, and um, uh, looking at the set here, looking at these swivel chairs which grace it, it's almost as though when we're on, uh, on the set of The Voice, um, <laughs> with James as the Tom Jones of local government. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I hope he doesn't swing round at any point in order to administer another stiff rebuke to me. But it's a pleasure to be here in Harrogate. Um, and, of course, this is my first LGA conference in this role. So those of you with long memories will remember that way back in 2010, a callow and inexperienced education secretary addressed the LGA conference in Bournemouth. Um, and uh, it's great to be back. And it's great to be back in Harrogate. And it's great to see the local government sector stronger than ever before. And I'd like to begin by saying something that I suspect you all hear much too rarely. Thank you. Anyone who puts themselves up for election and seeks to serve their community deserves the gratitude of us all. And as James has just reminded us, all too often when people who do put themselves forward for public office are greeted with uh, incivility and, um, uh, and face uh, some of the types of behavior that he's outlined, um, we need everyone to speak out against that and everyone to celebrate the fact that our democracy depends on your efforts. And in particular, I want to say thank you to everyone here for the way in which you've risen to the challenges that James enumerated in his speech. Because I know that for local government, the last few years have been tough. Tight budgets, rising costs, a deadly pandemic, and now, the percussive shocks of war on the European continent. I'd like to thank everyone in this hall and beyond for their hard work, imagination, creativity, resilience, and compassion that you've all shown in the face of these challenges. And in particular, I'd also like to echo the thanks that James extended to, to Izzy, to Nick Forbes, to Sean Davis, to Joe Harris, and to Marion Overton. The Local Government Association and those of us in government benefit from the hard work of councillors from all parties and none. Your feedback, always constructive, often robust, is vital to ensuring that I can help you deliver for the communities that you serve. And I also in particular want to thank James for his exemplary leadership. James is always scrupulously fair. He is determinedly energetic on behalf of councils everywhere, <coughs> and he's formidably forensic in scrutinizing what we in central government are doing. He is a model public servant, and I hope that we can all together show our appreciation for James, Izzy, Nick, Sean, Joe, and Marianne. <clears throat> this 25th anniversary of the LGA comes at a time when the role that local government plays is at the heart of our national political debate. Every single one of the major challenges that we now face as a country uh, depends on local government. Whether it's leveling up and tackling inequality, helping the most vulnerable deal with inflationary pressures, reaching net zero, providing our citizens with safe, affordable, warm, decent homes, protecting and enhancing nature, tackling poor health, or supporting those who need social care as our population ages, or improving economic productivity. Without local government playing a leading role, we cannot meet those challenges. And every one of those challenges is easier to meet and master when local government is stronger. Now, I believe that we've got the strongest cohort of local government leaders in generations. And I believe that you've proved that in response to the challenges of the past three years. As James said, it was local government that ensured that we as a nation could play our part in supporting those fleeing conflict and persecution across the world. Over 70,000 Ukrainians and indeed 20,000 evacuees from Afghanistan have been welcomed in the UK over the last year. And indeed on top of that, over 110,000 visas have been issued to British nationals from Hong Kong coming to our shores. Now of course there's more to do to support both our Ukrainian and Afghan friends and as you'll all be aware, we've just announced that we're going to allow children and minors under the age of 18 who've already applied through the Homes for Ukraine scheme to come to the UK without a parent or guardian. But we simply couldn't have provided that support. We simply wouldn't be in a position to help uh, so many without the active and engaged work of local government. So on behalf of the Cabinet, can I thank you all for everything you're doing on behalf of those who need our support most. And throughout the pandemic too, you collectively in this hall have shown local government 
public service at its best. With councils like Swindon, which turned its iconic historic railway station, Steam, into a vaccination centre. Or Oxfordshire, which pooled resources between the county council and the district councils to put in place a comprehensive system um, which ensured that there was a uh, coherent and holistic approach towards COVID compliance and enforcement. And indeed, Oldham, who worked so closely with community leaders to address vaccine hesitancy in some communities that they managed to get nearly all over 60s to have a first vaccine last April. And in addition, everyone in this hall, through everyone in and protect, have contributed to a 37% decrease in rough sleeping during the COVID pandemic, with a further 9% reduction over the last year. As a result, rough sleeping is now at an eight-year low. That is a remarkable achievement, adding up to lives protected and saved by you in local government. These achievements deserve to be celebrated, but it's not enough just to acknowledge local government's achievements. We need to ensure that local government has more power in the future to make a positive difference. As James said, I believe that power should always and everywhere be exercised as close to the people as possible. Devolution, decentralization, decisions made by accountable local leaders, that is the path to democratic renewal, the real taking back control. And that's why the leveling up white paper puts strengthening local leadership and local communities at the heart of our mission to reverse the persistent geographic inequalities which hold back communities across the whole UK. It's clear that overcoming these indefensible divisions is a shared challenge for all parts of government, central and local, and also for all political parties, Conservative, Labour, Liberal Democrat, Green and Independent, because no one's got a monopoly on all the necessary solutions or all the required tools to achieve levelling up. We need to work together, and that's why I want to see local government, whatever the political colour of its leadership, empowered and strengthened. It's why I'll be in Liverpool shortly, working with Steve Rotherham, and while I'll be in West Yorkshire later this month to work with Tracy Braben. My duty is to support local democratic leadership to deliver for communities that have been undervalued and overlooked in the past. That's what the communities that we serve expect and what I'm committed to working with all of you to achieve. Tackling persistent inequalities is a social justice mission and it's one which is more urgent and important now than ever because we know that the inflationary pressures that are coming bear particularly heavily on the poorest. That's why we in central government are committed to doing everything we can to support the most vulnerable through this difficult time. My friend Rishi Sunak has, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, delivered a £37 billion package to help those hardest hit by inflation. And of course, local government is an indispensable partner in the delivery of that support through reductions in council tax and the administration of discretionary payments. But if we're to check and reverse inequality in the long term, we, we must do more, not just support for the most vulnerable at this time of trial, but reform to ensure that all our communities are stronger, more resilient, more productive, and in more control of their destinies. And I appreciate that in the immediate months ahead, local government faces formidable pressures. The accumulating demands on adult social care, the challenges facing children's social care, the pressures to support children with special educational needs, the economies which inevitably affect non-statutory services, and the additional expectations that we have in planning and housing. We will do everything that we can to support you through these challenging times. James and other colleagues have outlined to me what we can do in my department in terms of funding and by other routes to support you at this time. But while I do not for a second underestimate the pressures that we will all face in the months ahead, they only reinforce my conviction that the way to emerge stronger and fairer as a nation over time is to further empower local communities, to build resilience, to shape solutions to our problems, to innovate and to drive regenerations. And it's those principles which underlie our levelling up and regeneration bill, which is explicitly designed to strengthen local government and strengthen local leadership. The bill and our wider approach towards devolution marks a significant and I hope irreversible commitment towards strengthening local leadership. Respecting local democracy means, of course, recognising that there will be different solutions and different structures which work in different parts of our United Kingdom. What works in Sunderland may not be right in Surrey. But more power to Sunderland and more control for Surrey's local leaders has to be the way to go. However, as we do devolve, I have to observe that there are certain models which have been clearly successful 
and have the potential to be even more transformative in seeing power move away from Whitehall and Westminster. My friend and former colleague George Osborne took considerable risks in extending the mayoral model outside London, but I believe that his judgment has been more than vindicated. At the time, the institutional treasury view was skeptical. Do you really want to give up control, Minister? Some of my Conservative colleagues were fearful. Tees Valley having its own mayor? Isn't that a recipe for less economic dynamism rather than more? Some civil servants in Whitehall worried that since they knew best, devolution was folly. All too many voices in Westminster believe that the really important decisions should always be taken there. In the postcode lottery, those in SW1 had won the crucial ticket and they should remain the decision makers. But George's judgment, I believe, has been powerfully and rightly vindicated by events. You can't have a northern powerhouse without more power being exercised in the north. You can't have economic growth equitably spread across the country without strong, locally accountable leaders whose mandate and mission is driving prosperity in their areas. So in Tees Valley, Ben Houchen has been presiding over his region's rebirth as a high-tech, high-skill, global powerhouse. He's made long-term decisions uh, to set up Teesside for future success by borrowing against their gain share and enterprise zone income to produce a 588 million pound investment plan running to 2029. And as a result, he was able to secure flagship strategic investments, such as taking over Teesside International Airport, delivering on the priorities on which he was elected, ensuring re-election, bringing prosperity to his region. In Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham has also shown leadership. Now, I disagree with Andy on lots, but he's got a clear mandate, and he's demonstrated what strong local leadership can do on transport, where he's shown vision, on economic development, where he's been broad-minded, and on innovation, where he's taken political risks to support the private sector. Andy knows that his period in office will be judged on results, and that is at the heart of devolution. As Andy Street also knows in the West Midlands, He's shown amazing leadership on brownfield regeneration, on tackling homelessness and rough sleeping, on, ad on adult education, on transport investment, on support for manufacturing and innovation, and on work to meet our net zero commitments. He led the work to develop a competitive, flexible, and secure modern energy system through energy capital. Its aim to facilitate low cost, clean, and efficient power is local leadership helping to meet a global emergency. As I argued earlier, I believe you've got the best cohort of leaders in local government for many generations. But I also believe the mayoral model has undeniably seen many more talented leaders devoting themselves to public service and local government. Whether it's Ben Houchen and Andy Street or Andy Burnham and Tracy Braben, the future in politics is increasingly local and that is undeniably a good thing. And the stronger the powers that local leaders have, the more that they will be judged on their decisions instead of other factors intervening. I believe that uh, with a mayor, having a directly accountable figure with a fixed term and a clear mandate makes it much easier for communities to make judgments based on local performance and local delivery rather than the ebb and flow of national politics. Local leaders deserve to be judged on their performance rather than suffering from or benefiting from national political trends. Just as US state governors can be elected or re-elected in red states or in blue states, depending on their plans and record, rather than the plans and record of those in Washington. So we should seek to make local mandates matter more and local delivery decisive when it comes to elections. And that's why we're working with you to strengthen and deepen devolution. Negotiations for a new mayoral combined authority for York and North Yorkshire are, as we heard, now in their final stages, alongside plans for an expanded mayoral combined authority for the Northeast. And we're also strengthening the hand of existing mayors through trailblazer deals with the West Midlands and Greater Manchester, with greater flexibility over how revenue is raised and spent. And while, as you can tell, I'm an unabashed admirer of the mayoral model, I also recognise that it won't be right everywhere. But greater devolution is right everywhere, which is why we're offering every part of England that wants one a new devolution deal by 2030 under a new coherent devolution framework. It's an agenda that will see counties, regions and districts which so far haven't benefited from devolution offered the chance to secure the kind of devolved powers which currently only our largest cities enjoy. So we've announced negotiations with Cornwall, Derby and Derbyshire and Nottingham and Nottinghamshire, Devon, Plymouth and Torbay, Durham, 
Hull in East Yorkshire, Leicestershire, Norfolk and Suffolk for early county deals. And we want to go further with more deals, more devolution, more power to the front line. Taken together, this amounts to the greatest devolution of power to local leaders and local communities since the Second World War. And to make the most of this moment, we need not just more power to local communities, but I also believe more transparency and accountability as well. Local communities deserve to know more about how all of us are performing, how effective new policies are, how cost-effective service delivery is. And we all want to be able to learn from the best, to celebrate the successes of local government and to spread good practice. But at the moment, I fear it's still too difficult to make those judgments in a granular way, to get a proper understanding of where excellence really lies. The answer, of course, lies in the better marshalling of data and the consequent ability to make more meaningful comparisons. Which local authorities really have the most innovative and effective children's services departments? Which councils have contributed most to net zero? Which communities have the best performing planning departments? The more accurately, rigorously, we can answer those questions, the more effectively we can capture and disseminate the public policy innovation which creates solutions to shared problems. The information is out there, and I saw earlier in your innovation zone efforts which were being made to ensure it was more effectively disseminated. But that information is still not as easy to navigate as it should be. I know this is a priority for the LGA. I know that James and his team are working to ensure we have better data collection and analysis across local government through LG Info and other tools. I will do everything I can to support and champion that work. And we won't just cheerlead, we'll also get on the pitch as well. We're going to create a new body, an office for local government, to shine a light on how local authorities are performing and delivering. It will initially bring together, analyse and publish existing data, because we want this to be useful for local readers rather than an administrative burden. Um, and the data that we gather will cover the services that matter most to the public, such as education, refuse collection, recycling, adult social care, and in due course, of course, we'll also look at broader issues such as climate change, the race to net zero, and also the effectiveness of all partners in the integration of health and social care. As a result, I believe that taxpayers will be able to see which councils are going furthest on the environment, which are pioneering transformative children's services, and which are providing best value for money in an annual report on local government performance overall. And it must be right to have clear information on measures like finances and value for money. And also, it must be right to have the opportunity to highlight excellence in local government, to celebrate it and to share best practice. Because we really should celebrate the work of councils like Essex, which through its Care Leavers Charter is providing a great model of wraparound services that better supports care leavers while also saving time and money. We should also celebrate councils like Newham in London, which has reduced fly tipping by over 70% over two years through a hard-hitting enforcement campaign informed by an imaginative research partnership with Keep Britain Tidy. I want to strengthen the hand of the authorities like these, which are doing the right thing, innovating and delivering for those they serve. And at the same time, I want to improve our understanding in central government of the picture across local government, so we know where action needs to be taken, where support needs to be given, what it is that we need to do to work with you. And to that end, therefore, I want to work with you in the sector, with the experts, you, to ensure that we get this right for councillors and residents alike. And we'll be announcing more details about the work to shape this body in the coming months. But as well as celebrating the best of local government, and there is so much to celebrate, we must also, from time to time, take action when authorities do fall short. And two recent high-profile instances, although they're not the only ones, have thrown this into sharper relief. I'm referring, of course, to Liverpool City Council and Slough Borough Council. In Liverpool's case, the arrest of the former mayor and the ongoing police investigation into alleged corruption and illegal activity triggered a best value inspection in 2020, and my department had to send in commissioners last year. In Slough's case, long-running mismanagement by the Borough Council, with little or no effective scrutiny of decision-making, let residents down. And again, we had to send in commissioners to address failings in financial management and governance. In both cases, there's been the common thread of weak leadership. And I'm sure that all of you, like me, find these failings wholly unacceptable. It's not just the case that the people of Liverpool and Slough deserve better, and I'm determined to ensure that they get it. It is also the case, as we all know, that local services matter. 
The reputation of local government matters. The cause of greater devolution and decentralization, the reinvigoration of our democracy, is set back when there are conspicuous and glaring failures of leadership in some councils. So in backing you, I'm also asking you to back what is right for the sector overall, for us all to be more assertive and willing to speak up when things are going wrong and the noble ideals of public service and local democracy for which local government stands are not being respected. And in return, I can promise you that I will remain a strong and determined champion of local government, of decentralization and devolution. I'm acutely aware, of course, that given the economic backdrop, that that means that I have to play my part in ensuring that you get the resources and the tools that you need to do your job in the months ahead. You need and deserve financial certainty, not just to deliver services over the coming period, but to think long-term about investing in levelling up. The case for multi-year funding settlements has been well made by James and others in the LGA team. So I am pleased to confirm that from next year, I will be introducing a two-year financial settlement to give you additional certainty and confidence. And my department will be launching a consultation on our new funding approach shortly. I hope that it will allow you to plan ahead with a, a greater degree of confidence and really focus on the delivery of great public services that represent value for money. But I'm also conscious if we talk about funding, that as James reminded us, the number of central government funds for which you bid is well into the hundreds. And the amount of bureaucracy around them puts a significant burden on local government. So we're looking closely at what we can do and we will reduce the number of streams, reduce the number of pots and reduce the burdens on you. I hope that this element of greater certainty and the certainty of funding simplification is good news for local government. But we all know that this difficult economic period isn't going to end overnight. So we will continue to work closely with you all, with the LGA, to keep the financial situation under review and to understand the impact in the coming weeks and months. I encourage you through this time, as you did over the pandemic, to be collaborative and creative, to be open and flexible to new ways of doing things and to learning from others, not to be hampered by boundaries or functional responsibilities. But I also promise you that I will be there in order to ensure that we provide the support and the funding necessary to get through this. Because what matters ultimately is how together we serve our people and our places. And ultimately, for central and for local government, success comes through partnership. We won't always agree, and the difficult days ahead will no doubt test us all. But it's in that spirit that I believe I should do my job. Backing you with the greatest possible devolution of power to local leaders, making sure that communities feel that they are back in control, providing increased investment and certainty over funding, making sure that there are incentives to innovate, collaborate and excel, balancing those with stronger accountability and transparency, high standards of stewardship, and a greater willingness to challenge those who do fall short. The potential prize within our grasp could not be greater. Better public services, the delivery of greater opportunity, progress towards greater social justice, our democracy renewed and strengthened. That is what it means to level up and to unite our country. And with your support, that is what I believe we can together deliver. Thank you.